One of the fears that captains live and work with is waking up in the middle of the night to find out that their vessel has collided or run aground. In the late evening, when retiring to their cabin and leaving the bridge to the watchkeeping officer, they want to believe that this person can control the situation, recognize danger, and take effective actions to avoid collision, or, at the very least, understand when the situation is getting out of hand and when it's time to call the captain to manage the situation. The hero of this story, Captain Yaroslav, experienced this fear turning into reality. In the early hours of September 18, 2021, while navigating from Novorossiysk to Egypt with a cargo of wheat, the vessel Levantes, under Yaroslav's command, was exiting the Dardanelles Strait. After beginning of sea passage, he found all under control to have a rest in his cabin. He had rested in the cabin for the next working day, but a harsh awakening awaited him very soon. It was a sharp jolt that threw me from my bed. I heard a terrible loud screeching of metal and a dreadful vibration. I realized something horrific had happened. I opened the curtain of the porthole and saw that we had collided with another vessel. I dressed as quickly as possible and rushed to the bridge. There, I saw the second officer standing at the helm, terror in his eyes, holding his head with both hands. After the collision, the ships drifted apart by inertia, and the main engine stopped in emergency mode. I announced a general alarm. The entire crew gathered at the assembly point, and it was crucial to assess the damage to understand whether we were sinking. It was evident that the bow was damaged, but I couldn't tell if water was entering the first hold. Visually, it was apparent that our trim by head was increasing, but we needed to understand whether we were actually sinking and the extent of the damage. Naturally, the emergency party went on deck to take soundings in the ballast tanks and the holds bilge wells. Dealing with the collision, the captain began actions according to the emergency manual. The standard checklist first mandates ensuring the crew has safely survived the collision. For this purpose, a general ship alarm is announced, and the crew heads to the muster station. What they will face is unknown so it's essential to arrive in a composed state, dressed in safe clothing and ready to abandon the ship if necessary. The chief officer also arrives at the assembly point to check the presence of the crew members, then reports to the bridge about whether the crew has fully assembled or if anyone is missing. If someone fails to arrive at the assembly point, immediate actions are taken to find the missing sailor or determine their situation. The crew gathered at the assembly point then acts according to the emergency schedule, splitting into several groups acting based on the situation. Normally, this looks like an emergency party of four to five people led by the chief officer, a technical team of engineers and motormen under the chief engineer, and a support party for preparing to possibly abandon the ship and provide first aid. In general, the organization of the crew in an emergency looks approximately like this. Each unit has its leader, who maintains communication with the bridge using VHF radios. Thus, coordination in emergency situations are achieved. In the event of a collision and grounding, after ensuring the crew is safe, the standard emergency checklist prescribes an assessment of the ship's damages. This includes a visual inspection and soundings of ballast tanks, sumps of holds, all to ensure that no water is entering the compartments, and if it is, into which ones and how quickly it is also crucial to understand whether there has been environmental pollution and if there is a threat of it. At the same time, one of the deck officers takes charge of radio communication and entries in the ship's log and radio log. Once the situation is under control, immediate contact is made with the other vessel to inquire if they need any assistance. After ensuring that there is no danger to the ship, people and the environment, 
the captain reports the incident to the shipping company's office. Typically, such reports follow a clear template or form where dozens of fields with all necessary information must be filled, from the name of one's own vessel to the results of measurements and observations. It must be understood that people who are woken up in the middle of the night by a phone call will only grasp that something has happened. The further information about what, where, and how necessary for them to act will be found in their email client. Therefore, the report to the company and the gathering of information are very important. After the general alarm was sounded, we lowered the lifeboat to the main deck level. The emergency team proceeded to take soundings in the tanks and holds. The chief mate inspected the damages at the bow of the ship. The damages were such that the bosun store was in very poor condition. It was impossible to descend into it properly. Paint, chemical cleaning agents, spare parts, and maintenance materials for the ship were all in a disheveled state. A full inspection could not be performed because it was dark and unclear how exactly the ship was damaged. Soundings of the ballast tanks and bilge well showed that there was no significant water ingress. However, it later became clear that due to the ship's list to the bow, detecting water in the ballast tanks on early stage was impossible. This assumption was later confirmed, as the measurements in the tanks became increasingly alarming. We activated the ballast pumps to discharge the incoming water overboard, but this also turned out to be not so simple. The ballast system was damaged, and air was entering it, eliminating the vacuum. It was also discovered that we had completely lost the port side anchor. The starboard anchor was in place, but due to deformations and damages to the hull, it was blocked. We contacted the captain of the other ship via VHF radio and asked if any help was needed. We were ready to provide assistance in case the other vessel began to sink. If a collision or heavy damage situation occurs within the territorial waters of any state or very close to them, it is imperative to immediately report the incident to the local authorities. Besides saving human lives, the local administration is always interested in preventing environmental pollution if there's a risk of it happening. Failing to report an incident while in someone's territorial waters is considered a very serious violation, potentially leading to criminal liability. Typically, captains prefer not to deal with local authorities during such emergencies because they understand that any information provided during legal proceedings can be used against them. During emergencies, when actions are driven by adrenaline, it can be challenging to discern which information should be shared and which is better kept undisclosed. In such situations, the company's in-house lawyer, who is always part of the rapid response team on shore, provides instructions to the captain as soon as possible. Until then, captains tend to delay providing any additional information about the incident under the pretext of needing to ensure safety. After gaining control of the situation, we reported to the Turkish Coast Guard dispatcher. The other vessel also made a report. Their damages were significantly more severe. We struck their second hold on the port side, causing their bow to submerge in water and a strong list to develop on their port side. I saw that they had already lowered a lifeboat to the water in case they needed to abandon the ship. After a while, two or three tugs arrived and towed the other vessel into Turkish territorial waters. I informed the Turkish authorities that despite the damages, my vessel was not in danger. When they asked about my intentions, I said I intended to head to a neighboring Greek island. By the way, collision happened in neutral waters, so Turks did not provide any orders. Since the other vessel was in danger, all attention of the Turkish Coast Guard was focused on them. As for us, we headed west towards the Greek island, which was 44 miles away. We proceeded at a slow speed because attempts to increase the main engine's revolutions resulted in increased vibration. Eventually, we arrived there by 9 o'clock in the morning. It was clear that ending up with the Turks on a Greek ship, it was something to avoid, so he decided to head for the nearest Greek island. Upon reaching Greek jurisdiction, the captain reported the incident, which initiated a series of actions to get the vessel back in operation. It was already daylight, which allowed for a full inspection of the damages from the collision. The entire four-peak compartment was crushed into the bulkhead of the first hold, 
due to the hull's deformation. The welds of the first compartment were also damaged, causing water to enter the ballast tanks and the hold loaded with wheat. The anchor gear was critically damaged, making it impossible to anchor, so we had to drift near the Greek island for several days until all paperwork was completed. After such damages, the vessel is considered not seaworthy and not in compliance with the convention, automatically losing its status. The representative from the classification society who came on board removed the statutory certificate and issued a permit for the passage to the ship repair yard. Motor vessel Levantes, like almost all cargo vessels nowadays, is registered under a flag of convenience. Although a flag of convenience provides nothing but the registration documents to the vessel, international law still requires the flag administration to conduct an investigation and an authorized representative of the Marshall Islands flag boarded the vessel. From the second officer's testimony, it was learned that he took over the watch while the vessel was heading at a course of 212 degrees with good weather and visibility. He performed checks according to the checklist and made an entry in the ship's log. Around 0.20 a.m. he started to observe small fishing vessels and vessels that were drifting, apparently waiting for permission to enter the Dardanelles Strait. To safely pass them, he changed course to the starboard side by 10 degrees from 212 to 222 degrees. Thus the vessel began to deviate from the plotted course, a deviation that was one of the factors that later led to the collision. But by 01 a.m., when the drifting vessels and fishing vessels had been passed, the second officer began to come back to plotted route by small course alterations to port side. Approximately at this time, he began to observe a target vessel with which a collision was imminent. As the second officer reports, they observed it at a distance of four to five miles. With the bow and stern lights visible as well as the red port side light, the vessel was approaching at a speed of 13.5 knots. The automatic radar plotting system showed that it would pass at six cable. After this, the second officer did something that greatly contradicts good maritime practice. He went to the chart room, according to him, to send a message. A draft was already open on the desktop into which he only needed to enter some data, and the report message was ready to be sent. As the second officer says, he intended to be there for only a minute, but how long he actually stayed there is unknown. Besides sending the message, the second officer made some entries in the radio log. I don't remember how long I spent there, but I think it was no more than five to ten minutes. After he left the chart room, he saw the clipper Como at a close distance on the starboard side. He rushed to the helm and switched control to manual mode, turned the rudder starboard. In horror, he watched as clipper Como approached us, hoping the collision would be avoided, but we collided. I think it was a minute or two since I left the chart room. We hit the Clipper Como at a right angle. The people from the shipping company ask me, Captain, how could this have happened? And I respond, just like that. In addition to the vessel we collided with, there were other vessels ahead, I remember there was one tanker. After we safely passed it, the second officer began to make small and unnoticeable turns to the port side by 3 to 5 degrees. These course changes altered the passing distance between the vessels. The two watch officers did not communicate with each other at all. It gives the impression that they simply did not see each other until they realized a collision was imminent. As is often the case in such situations, the restoration of a vessel requires a lot of effort and time. This time was no exception as the accident put the Levante's vessel out of operation for a period of three to four months. The ship proceeded to the Greek port of Chalkis, where a ship repair yard was located. However, it was impossible to start repairs immediately because the vessel could not enter the dry dock with cargo. Therefore, the first step was to unload the ship at the anchorage. Now, the shipping company had to figure out how and where to unload. For this purpose, a similar vessel and a floating crane were chartered. We have arrived to the anchorage. Since our anchoring gear was critically damaged, a team from the ship repair yard arrived with all necessary equipment. 
they made a temporary repair to one of the anchors. The following period was very long. We waited for the vessel onto which we could transship our cargo. This expectation lasted one month. Every time, it's surprising that something that happened in 10 minutes out of carelessness can have consequences for months and sometimes even years. While we were at the anchorage, representatives from the shipping companies, the shipyard, and insurers visited the vessel every day. Divers inspected the hull, and shipyard representatives prepared estimates for future repair works. Additionally, representatives of the charterer came to the vessel. And I had to work with all these people. Every day, there were about 10 visitors on board. Fortunately, in this case, there was no environmental pollution. Otherwise, the consequences would have been much more severe. The biggest problem was cargo hold number one. The cargo in this hold was damaged by seawater and began to spoil. Therefore, it was necessary to segregate the spoiled cargo. In the end, it turned out that about 3,000 tons of wheat were spoiled, which were later unloaded ashore. After the ship finally managed to enter the dry dock, the repair and restoration process began. The ship repairers had to completely rebuild the entire four-peak compartment, as well as a part of the first bulkhead. This shipyard is not known for its capabilities, and it took them a couple of months to complete this work. Afterwards, they painted and brought it back to working condition. A re-inspection by the Classification Society was required. New documents were issued to the ship, and it was reclassed, allowing it to operate once again. The cost of this accident to the insurers is unknown. However, taking the ship out of operation for three, four months, when it not only fails to generate revenue but also incurs costs, is a significant blow to the business. The larger the shipping company, the better it can withstand accidents and losses. Conversely, the smaller the business and the fewer the ships, the higher the likelihood that an accident could bankrupt the company. What do you think? Why did this happen? It was human factor. This accident became possible because the second officer, having a crossing target on the starboard side that crosses the course, and passes at a distance of about half a mile, did not execute a decisive maneuver for safe passing, thereby violating Rule 8, action to avoid collision. Additionally, the second officer did not realize that the cumulative speed of both vessels provided a convergence rate of 20 knots, meaning that just 10 minutes after he went to the chart room, the minimum distance of approach had arrived. Entering the chart room, he lost track of time. Seeing the radio log, he remembered he had to make an entry and ended up staying there from 7 to 10 minutes. A sailor named Ibrahim, who was on the bridge with the second officer, did not remind him of the approaching vessel and the danger. The practice of assigning a sailor to the bridge from 0 to 4 in the morning is exactly for the purpose of providing backup to the second officer at night. A half-mile distance for passing, especially on crossing courses, is too little. Good maritime practice in the open sea prescribes passing at a distance of one to two and a half miles, keeping in mind that the radar plotting system itself has an error margin in calculations, and the less time since target acquisition, the greater the calculation error. Moreover, according to available information, the second officer made a series of minor turns to the left to return to the plotted course. Such an action was extremely imprudent because his small, imperceptible turns distorted the readings of the automated radar plotting system. Since the system does not immediately respond to minor course changes, it takes about three to five minutes for it to average the data and provide a more or less accurate result. An important factor was that the navigation equipment of the Levantes, built in 2001, was by current standards archaic. Manifested in that data from the AIS system, 
did not integrate with the ship's radar, meaning that information transmitted from the AIS transponders of other vessels was not displayed on the radar screen. The discrepancy between AIS data and radar data is a very important indicator that something is wrong and calls for extreme caution. As for Clipper Como, its actions, or rather inactions, can be described as a violation of Rule 17, where if one vessel should give way to another, the other must maintain its course and speed. According to the rules, Levante was required to give way to Clipper Como, and Clipper Como indeed maintained its course and speed. When it becomes apparent that the vessel obligated to give way is not taking appropriate action, the vessel that should be given way may take action to avoid collision unilaterally by its own maneuver. However, when for whatever reason the vessel that should be given way is so close to the other that collision cannot be avoided by the action of the give way vessel alone, it must take such action as will best aid in avoiding collision. Thus, according to this rule, when the distance becomes too small, maneuvering to avoid collision transitions from an option to an obligation. As we see, the watch officer of Clipper Como did not undertake any actions to avoid collision till the end. Although my officer said that he observed this target on the radar and observed it on the electronic map. I don't know if they saw each other, but the fact that they did not see the danger is for sure. Rule 5. Lookout. Every vessel must at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing, as well as by all available means appropriate in the prevailing circumstances and conditions to fully appraise the situation and the risk of collision. Rule 7. Risk of Collision. Every vessel must use all available means appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions to determine if the risk of collision exists. If there is any doubt, it shall be deemed that such a risk exists. Thus, the primary requirement from a watchkeeping officer is not to overlook any danger, to identify it in time, and to act preemptively. If you are not entirely sure of your actions, or if anything is unclear, you must immediately pick up the phone and call the captain. A distinctive feature of the second officer's position is that, although it is a junior officer rank, the second officer carries the responsibility of an independent watch from midnight until 4 a.m. It is a period when both the captain and the rest of the crew are asleep. Periodically, on the bridges of cargo ships, Individuals specifically aim to pass at dangerously close distances when there is ample room to maneuver around. They do this for the thrill, to assert themselves, to boast and show off how cool they are. Colleagues who had worked with the person responsible for the accident before noted his tendency to pass at dangerously close distances. A vivid example of such behavior is the sinking of the Costa Concordia passenger ship when the captain, attempting to show off by navigating close to the rocks, doomed the ship. A delayed maneuver and the decision to turn the rudder starboard just before the collision was also a bad idea. Moving right to prevent a collision works well if the maneuver is performed well in advance and at safe distances. However, starting to turn towards a vessel that is half a mile or so away is a bad idea. For both ships to execute a turn and pass at a safe distance, they should have been at least half a mile apart in this case. However, by the time the watch officers on both vessels realized what was happening and made their last efforts by turning the rudder starboard, such a margin no longer existed. In this case, turning right only exacerbated the collision. It is reasonable to assume that for Levantes, turning the rudder to port might have prevented the collision or at least allowed for a glancing blow without severe damage. However, things turned out as they did.
It's undeniable that maritime accidents will continue to occur. It's impossible to know when, where, and how they will happen for anyone. The story told in this film is fortunate in the sense that no lives were lost. There was no environmental damage, there were no mass funerals, and there were no criminal prosecutions that divide a person's life into before and after. It's a relief that Clipper Como was not a tanker or a ferry carrying many passengers. Otherwise, the outcomes and consequences of the accident would have been completely different, incomparably more severe and long-lasting. Whether an accident will occur in your practice is unknown, but one must always remember that it can happen to you, as the human factor and the theory of probability are existing. <laughs>